All right, so next we're going to talk about RIP and the configuration associated with RIP. Now, to summarize RIP real quick, it is a classful routing protocol that's very, very easy to implement, and that's one of the powerful things about RIP and why it survived so long. Um, and unfortunately, it has a very slow convergence time, um, and the limit is 15 hops, so you can only use it in very small networks. Now, it's not vendor-specific, so you'll find a lot of different routers running RIP, including a few consumer routers even, so the router at home uh, that you have running that may be on a, connected to a DSL modem or perhaps a uh, you know Cox cable modem may be actually able to run RIP. RIP configuration uh, is fairly straightforward. Uh, you implement the command router RIP under global config mode, and after that you will type each network uh, one after the other, and you just type the network number. You'll notice there's no subnet mask here, and RIP does not care about subnet masks. So, for example, if you were to type 10.8.0.0 to try to get the 10.8 network to be uh, advertised by RIP, the router would assume that you're talking about all 10.0.0.0 slash 8 networks, um, and it's going to replace your command with the command 10.0. 0 .0 .0. It looks at classful boundaries, so we have to be very, very careful. Um, optionally, if you wanted to specify a passive interface, an interface where RIP is not advertised, you can specify it with the command down there on the bottom, passive-interface, Ethernet 0 slash 0. And so these, no subnet mask is needed, again, because RIP operates on major networks. Uh, keep in mind that RIP will automatically summarize between these major networks. You can't use variable length subnet masking when you want to use uh, RIP. There's the passive interface command. Like I said, it disables routing advertisements. However, RIP will still listen for advertisements coming inbound on those interfaces. Uh, now, here are some of the problems associated with RIP. Um, so consider the following. You have a link failure on one router, and router 1 receives an advertisement from router 2 that the net failed network is two hops away. Now, router 2 is down the link somewhere, um, and so it, when the network was up, router 1 received the route directly from, let's say, a router 0 that it was advertising that network. Um, but now that that link's down, it receives a separate advertisement from router 2 saying, hey, the network is two hops away. Router 1 will install a new route because the failed network on router 0 was inaccessible. And uh, router 1 will advertise this route to router 2 with a hop count of 3. Since router 2 learned its original network with a hop count of 1, it'll see now the advertisement from router 1 with a hop count of 3. It'll install the new route and continue forward. And the cycle will basically continue until one of them hits the hop count of 16. Um, now, the hop count of 16 on a RIP network basically means that the route is unreachable. And so what will happen is eventually, once this, advertise, once this route is advertised as unreachable, the route will be removed. But this takes quite a while to happen. And so the problem above is known as the counting to infinity problem. Now, I advise you, um, because it's kind of hard to explain on a presentation like this with much clarity, I advise you to look at the scenario above in the book and try to figure out what's going on in this sort of a situation and to figure out exactly what the count to infinity problem is. And you should be aware that this is a problem with RIP. Um, and so the issue will go away, like I said, after the count reaches 16, which is considered unreachable or infinite for RIP. Now, there's some solution to this problem. Uh, one of them is reverse poisoning with trigger updates. Uh, reverse poisoning, you now the idea here is when a route fails, when a link fails, or when the route knows that, the, or when a router knows that the link has failed, it will immediately send an advertisement that the route is unreachable. This is the reverse poisoning being that it sends the route with a hop count of 16, and the Im triggered updates, meaning that it sends the route uh, regardless of what the timers are, will send it immediately. And rather than wait for an update timer to expire, as I mentioned, the update is triggered as soon as the link fails, rather than waiting for that 30-second timer with RIP. Other routers see the advertisement, they remove the route, and that's that. This prevents a failed route from being re-advertised by a router that used to know about the network from a longer distance away. Now, split horizon is another interesting thing that kind of prevents these uh, sort of failures from happening. One, the main problem that uh, we had with this scenario above was that router 2 in this scenario re-advertised over a link where it received the route from. And normally, that's not the case. Normally, you want router information to flow down. And so uh, split horizon, the idea here is that networks are not advertised back over to routers from which the network was learned. And normally, split horizon is a very good thing because you want information to trickle down from one router to the next. There are a few scenarios where you'd want to turn off split horizon, but for the most part, you'll want to leave it on. Um, another thing that we have to worry about is a hold down timer. Since we want to prevent routing loops from occurring, we want to make sure that topology changes don't occur too quickly. And so once a route is marked as down, we want to keep that route down regardless of whatever other advertisements happen for a period of time, and that'll permit routing loops. And the idea here is that, let's say we have an interface flapping, 
the router will at first uh, advertise it as a cost of 16. It'll advertise it as unreachable. And then what'll happen is if the link comes back up after a period of, say, three seconds, it'll re-advertise the route again with a cost of you know, zero or a hop count of one. And uh, then it'll go back down. It'll re-advertise it again. And we want to prevent this route from changing over and over again. This is a very CPU intensive process. And so the idea here is that we have a hold down timer. So once the route is marked down, it stays down for a little bit just to make sure that everything's stable. Now here are some of the timers associated with RIP. There's an update timer, and this is how often updates are advertised to neighbors, and the default on this is 30 seconds. Now we also have an invalid timer, and this is the uh, time until, until a route is declared invalid. In other words, if it doesn't receive any updates for a route, it will declare the route invalid after 180 seconds. Um, and the hold down timer prevents loops, the default is also 180 seconds. And so once this hold down timer expires, uh, the route will be flushed, and uh, that call total time is 240 seconds. Again, this is just to make sure until the route is removed from the routing table. Um, this is just to make sure that no routing loops occur. Uh, and RIP version 2 is a little bit nicer. It'll actually advertise subnet mask information. And so if you're running RIP version 2, you can use VLSM. Uh, and it uses, instead of uh, using the IPv4 broadcast address, all 255s, all 1s, it'll actually use its own multicast address, which is uh, 224.0.0.9, to advertise updates. And that way, uh, not all devices uh, are listening. Because here's, here's what happens. Um, when a device is listening for broadcast versus multicast. If a device receives a broadcast, it has to process that frame, regardless of whether the frame is intended for it or not, it has to process it. And so if you're running version 1, those updates will be sent as broadcasts to the IPv4 broadcast address. And so even though they're not running RIP, all of your clients, all of your access points, every device on the network will need to process that frame. And that's a lot of uh, CPU on the network overall and a lot of bandwidth. Um, and so rather than do that, we set it to a multicast address, 220 Four zero zero nine, and this way the frame is discarded, or by by devices that are not listening for rip advertisements, and devices that are listening for rip advertisements will process the frame. Now, RIP version 2 can be used on VLSM networks, as I mentioned, and the configuring version 2 is very simple. All you need to do is, after specifying router RIP, you will specify the version number as version 2. Now here's the sample RIP topology, and you'll notice that all of the subnet masks in this topology are the same length. They're all slash 24, so this is a good candidate for RIP. It's also a very small network, which makes sense. And so you'll have 10.0. subnets all over the place. We have They're all the same subnet length, and really they're all in the same major network. So all we need to do to configure this topology, go onto each router and configure router RIP. 10.0.0.0. You'll notice we just talk about the uh, major classful network. We talk about the network. We don't have to worry about any of the subnets. As soon as we specify the 10 network, all routes will be advertised. And here are some useful uh, iOS commands that you'll use. Uh, show IP routes, as we've talked about before. Uh, show IP route is useful with every single routing protocol that we'll talk about. Another command does show IP protocols. You can determine if RIP is running or not. Also, show IP interfaces brief. Very useful to see what interfaces are running, what their subnet masks are, all that good stuff. And debug IP RIP to see in RIP informational messages um, on the command prompt. All right, so that just about wraps it up for RIP. If you guys have any more questions, um, I would encourage you to ask in the comments. And I feel like I've kind of shortchanged on this uh, this particular presentation just because RIP is such a big topic. It's a lot bigger than most people realize, especially when you take uh, classical boundaries into consideration in RIP version 1. So I would encourage you to read more, uh, read up more in the book, um, and try to, you know, do some examples, implement it in the lab, ask me some questions in person. That way you guys have a good feel for what RIP is capable of doing. And again, I will see you in the next presentation.